Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mikkel Thorpe, and this is the Expat Money Show. Today's guest birthed the concept of Freedom Cells, which, with the help of other activists, has blossomed into a global web of radical, freedom-loving people, trading with each other, forming real-life communities together, and protecting one another, and paving the way for a free future. Come May, they will be hosting a summit that will take place in Texas that's all about how you can leave your city behind and build a community in the country. I'm always excited to learn about building new communities and how humans organize themselves. It's what we're doing internationally with expat money. So I am super excited to learn from today's guest. Please welcome to the show, John Bush. John, how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Why don't you take a moment and kind of walk us through your backstory, how you got into freedom and where the idea of freedom cells came from? Okay, sure. So I've been an activist for truth and liberty for about 20 years. I was a bit of a rabble rouser in high school and kind of bucked against the system, got in a lot of trouble. And then in 2002, I caught a documentary on Austin Cable Access. I live here in Central Texas, born and raised in Austin, Texas. I caught a documentary by Alex Jones, right? Love him or hate him. I used to love him. Now I'm not too, so fond of him, but he does say a lot of really cool things that end up becoming fact uh, when people thought they were theory. But I checked out this documentary about 9-11. It's called 9-11 Road to Tyranny. And that got me questioning the official story of what took place. That led down a rabbit hole of conspiracies. And I learned about this effort to create a global government and the Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, all this stuff, police state, surveillance state became an anti-war activist, was very much opposed to the Bush regime and the war on terror and the police and surveillance state that was being built at home. And so I started getting involved in activism. First, I did some ACLU stuff, then uh, some, you know, I thought I was a Republican for a while because I learned about Ron Paul, right? So I was an activist and then I learned about Ron Paul and then all of a sudden I'm like, okay, wow, I'm a libertarian. I believe in freedom and property rights and free markets. And so we participated pretty heavily in the Ron Paul for President campaign 2007, 2008, me and the community here. And after that wrapped up, we decided we got a lot of momentum. We built a lot of connections. There's a lot of us that believe in freedom. We should start a political action committee. So we started a PAC. This must have been around 2010, 2009. Uh, the, PAC, the political action committee is called Texans for Accountable Government, still around today. We actually had a lot of legislative victories. We stopped the Texas Family Protective Services, the CPS, from being able to go interview homeschool children without a court order. We stopped police officers from being able to tra uh, being trained to do blood withdrawals on the side of the road. We dressed up like vampire cops and paraded around the community. Uh, we I can't believe that was a get, thing. Jesus. Yeah, it's a thing. And, and we stopped them from the police officers, but now they just have a nurse at the jail that does it. So. Uh, we managed to push back on these fusion centers, which are Department of Homeland Security information gathering and intelligence centers that uh, merge local, state, and federal law enforcement with the FBI and stuff. We got these privacy policies put in place where they can't collect or share information of political, religious, or social views. So we like really went hard in the paint with political activism, investing time, money, resources. And I came to realize that in spite of what in spite of these victories, really they were empty victories. We weren't actually creating more freedom in our lives. Rather, we were simply slowing the growth of tyranny. It was around this time I met my ex-wife, the mother of my two kids, and she was already on that same page. She had done a lot of activism in Missouri. And together we kind of came to this realization, like if we want to create freedom in our lives, we have to take responsibility for the creation of that freedom. We shouldn't rely on politicians doing the right thing or trying to get people to vote the right way. So that's when we began becoming interested in alternative institutions. It started with silver dimes and, and alternative currencies. Uh, this was before I learned about cryptocurrency, which I'm a big fan of, growing your own food, uh, homesteading, off-grid technology, right? And then cryptocurrency, learned about that in like 2011, 2012. It just exploded and we went around the country visiting uh, communities and helping folks get set up to accept cryptocurrency, putting on meetups, right? But, you know, I came to realize, OK, because I was around the liberty movement for a while. And when people started to evolve into voluntarism and anarchism instead of minarchism, like a small government uh, and constitutional republic, conservative kind of deal. And I started realizing there's so many people that believe in freedom. They understand freedom, yet we're not living free. What's missing here? 
And I came to recognize that something that would help us immensely to actually assert our sovereignty is strength in numbers. The more of us that stand up together and build these alternative institutions, it becomes easier to opt out and to opt out peacefully where we don't get crushed by the man. And that's really how the freedom cell idea was birthed. I was also exploring the idea of small groups working together. When you have a larger group, it's bureaucratic, it's overwhelming, people aren't on the same page, but if you can have a bunch of small groups working together and then you link up the smaller groups to form larger groups, you can really make some stuff happen and do it in a decentralized way, which is more resilient and less corruptible. That's how the freedom cell idea came about. And uh, it started off with just me and a small group, uh, we called it inner cadre. And I kind of pulled back my good friend, Derek Bros. the idea resonated with him. And he actually was is who took it and spread it into a network. But before 9-11, sorry, before the new 9-11, the COVID-19 stuff, uh, we only had like a thousand people in the network. Now, fast forward to today, post COVID, we have like 32,000 people globally, which is really super cool. So uh, that's just a bit about my evolution and how the Freedom Cell Network came to be. Okay, well, let's get into some of the details, some of the nitty gritty about the Freedom Cells, because I did listen to you on another podcast and I thought, wow, this is such an excellent idea and it solves so many of the problems. Let's kind of catch people up a little bit on how it works and how they interact with each other, these different cadres. Okay, so the idea really on the surface level is to bring together like-minded people, in this case, people that value freedom, bodily autonomy, privacy, bring together people and work together on common goals. Everyone in the Freedom Cell Network is solutions oriented. We're non-political, no campaigns, no politicians. We don't wanna use the political system for anything. Uh, we are local. We encourage people to work with people in their area, in their neighborhood, even though it's a global network. And we are nonviolent. We use nonviolent means. That's not to say people can't defend themselves, but we're definitely opposed to the initiation of violence or aggression. We don't want to play on those terms because I think we're largely out, uh, outdone in, in those instances against the state. So it's like, okay, well, we're going to get together and work on common goals. What kind of goals? Well, we start off by encouraging people to work and to build an inner cadre group. That's a group of approximately eight people. We choose the number eight because the research by this guy, Bob Podolsky and John David Garcia, they discovered that eight people is the optimal number of people to have in a group in order to have maximum creativity. And what we're doing is creating and building and gardening and building homeschool co-ops. And, and ultimately we're trying to create a free society doesn't have to be eight people, it can be seven, it can be nine, it can be whatever you want, but that's what the optimal group is. So you have your inner cadre group, start working together on common goals. We encourage folks to focus on goals in the beginning centered around preparedness. Everyone has food storage, maybe three, three, three months worth. Everyone has uh, off-grid communication like CB radios or ham radio, or at least we have encrypted communication like Signal, an app or something. People know how to defend themselves preferably. People have a bug out plan, right? And that's, you know, we, we want people to be prepared to weather the storms, we encourage the, those goals in the beginning, but really people can work together on whatever the heck they want. Uh, some people get together and pull their kids out of government school. Some people get together and do yoga. Some people are focused on entrepreneurship and they have like a business mastermind. They're hiring one another. They're learning marketing together. Some people are going to the shooting range, for example. It's all about working together on things that help to create more freedom in your lives and then collectively working together to create these counter economies, these parallel networks. And so you, the focus is working with your small group, but from there it expands. You work with your approximately eight people, seven others, and then you link up with other inner cadre groups. And this forms a larger network that we call a middle cadre. So it's never this clean, but imagine eight groups of eight. Now you have a middle cadre of 64 people. This is spread out over a larger geographic area, for example. While most of your commitment and connection is with the inner cadre group, you still are connected and committed to supporting the larger network, right? And now imagine the middle cadre groups link up with the other groups in the area. And now you have what we call a meta cadre, a larger group working together. There's decision-making mechanisms. And ultimately what we want this to grow into is a, a large group of people that can make decisions in a decentralized voluntary way so we can have unified action, expenses, 
defense, support, building new things, building a community, buying land, hiring a private defense, high, private security force, for example. But it still remains decentralized where the power is with the individual. Uh -huh. And just for an example, here in Central Texas, we have over 700 people that are on our Central Texas Freedom Cell Telegram group. There is a Central Texas larger group, then there's a South Austin and a Bastrop County and a Williamson County and a Hill Country group. And so these groups do most of their activity together, but then they come together um, maybe once or twice a month as a larger body to learn and to do workshops and to, and to connect with one another. And it's, I mean, it's freaking working, it's growing, it's all across the world, Australia, Canada, Mexico, Europe, Southeast Asia, pretty phenomenal to see how this thing is kind of taking a life of its own. So, all right, let's get into a couple of the other details. When you say yourself and seven others, is this literally just seven people? Are you looking at uh, families or couples? Like, I, I heard a lot of these ideas, and then I was there were so many questions that I had. You know, I don't know who I would want to select to be in the group. Am I looking for just people that I have? great relationships with and are friends with? Am I looking at people who have a diverse set of skills? Um, you know, talk to us on this side a little bit for forming something. So deliberately and consciously in formulating this concept, I purposefully let it be up open to interpretation. Sure, sure. It's of course. not so rigid and structured. It's just like get together with a small group of people and do cool stuff and then link up with other small groups of people to do even bigger things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's a kind of a challenge because we want it to be a leaderless thing, but oftentimes people are still seeking direction. So I'm actually torn as you ask that question. I get that question all the time and people mm -hmm. kind of get caught up in it. And they're like, what if we don't have eight people? Is it, do the kids count? Do the couples count? Yeah. And I always respond like, it doesn't matter. It's just get together with like-minded people. But sometimes I feel like maybe we should say the kids don't count unless they're older than 13 or blah, blah, blah. But Or another way to think about it is there, you know, you have a lot of experience and you've seen which is really efficient and effective, what seems to work really well together. So maybe instead of, you know, what are the rules? It's more, what are some insights or some best practices to make sure that, you know, you're setting yourself up for success at the very beginning of this. Yeah. And that's how we try to lead, you know, because like myself and Derek are, are definitely seen as leaders in the community. And we try to, we try, just like you said, this is what we think will work best. This is what works best based on our experience. But here's the cool thing about the, the cell, right? Freedom cell. I like to use this analogy, like the individuals and in the smaller groups are cells in the body. And those cells communicate with the whole with the whole of the body, which is the network, right? And the health of the cells is contingent upon the health of the body, the network, just as the health of the network is contingent upon the health of the cells. And these cells ought to share information with one another so as to determine what the best path forward is. Um, so yeah, it, it just all depends on the particular group. And when, and when it comes to who to start with, I would focus on people that you trust, ideally. Not everyone has the luxury of having a bunch of people they trust in their, in their network or their local area, but you can find those people and start to vet them and build the relationships. And then work with people that are doers. That's a big mm. piece of advice, I would say. Folks that can take the initiative, folks that aren't. There's so many keyboard warriors and folks that are just debating online all day and they think activism is sharing the latest forwarding a post on Telegram, but really it's, it's much more than that. So I would try to align myself with people that are doing stuff. And another big thing is try to avoid folks that are drama because that's the biggest, more so than FBI infiltration or whatever. That's what everyone's always worried about. But at the end of the day, <laughs> I would worry more about personality conflicts and differences. Okay, that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that something like this will be so interesting to see internationally because I can imagine that you have a strong presence in the countries that you mentioned, US, Canada, Australia, and things like that. But down here in Panama, I'm excited to kind of go on and find out if anyone else has taken these ideas and are running with them. You know, I can think of a dozen people in my, you know, my group of friends who would be excellent. I have a really good friend who is a developer, real estate developer and does construction. And his wife is a doctor and a, she's a pediatrician. I have friends who are programmers. I have friends who work for security uh, companies or own their own security companies. So it's also really neat because it 
brings together so many different concepts that normally people would think about as being completely separate things. And then really actually shows that they're not separate things. They all do belong together. Like if you think, oh, I'm a prepper. Okay. A prepper is not going to be looking at marketing or online businesses or any of those types of things, you know, and someone who is looking for more freedom in their life or a libertarian might not be going out there and looking at permaculture or aquaponics or hydroponics or something, mm -hmm. you know, those types of names or brands or branches don't necessarily connect with one another. But I think in the freedom cells, you've done such an excellent job of showing that, no, all of these are real life strategies to actually implement more freedom in your life and move closer to freedom. So I really commend you for that. I think it's excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we have a website, freedomcells.org, cells like a cell in the body, freedomcells.org. And on the website, when you register, you can put your name, you can use a pseudonym if you want, put the skills that you possess, put what you're looking for in a community, and then you can put an address. So we encourage people not to put their home address. You can put a park down the street or a coffee shop near you, and then you can pull up a map. And oh, so nice. chances are there's actually probably people in Panama. I would imagine because that we're spread out all over the place. Like you said, there's a higher concentration in, in places that you would assume there are, but we have coverage in almost every single country. And the cool thing is even if you're in some space, you know, and you look on the map and there's like six people, that's a start, you know? Mm -hmm. And then the cool thing is like the six people can get together. They don't have to necessarily be the inner cadre themselves, but once you get people together, you could say, all right, let's come up with a plan for each of us to form our own inner cadres. And then before you know it, you have 50, 60 people. And yeah, like you point out, it, it's we're trying to do a holistic approach to the pursuit of freedom and all of those elements that you described, including marketing, entrepreneurship, earning a good income. Uh, there's a lot of folks that have limiting beliefs around money in the freedom community, unfortunately, but um, I assume you guys don't hear on this podcast. Yeah, we try, uh, to, we try to nip that one in the bud pretty quick. That's right. <laughs> that's right. It, you know, it's a holistic approach and all of those areas, permaculture, food production, money, uh, security, cryptocurrency, whatever, uh, privacy, communication, they're all part of an integrative approach to pursuing freedom and living from a place of sovereignty. And so, yeah, that, that's a cool thing because there's overlap here. Some people are experts over there and you don't have to be an expert, a Renaissance man on everything. Mm -hmm. But if you have people in your group that know how to grow food, then they can teach you or they'll be the ones that grow the food. And you're the one that brings in the money to buy the supplies or whatever. Well, because I've been doing this podcast now for six years and, you know, you could look back through episodes and think that these are really uncorrelated things. I've had people who have come on to talk about homeschooling and unschooling and world schooling. I've had people that have come on a on and to talk about off grid stuff. We do entrepreneurship, we do investing. So it's all of these connections as well that seem so straightforward to me, but a lot of people kind of miss the point. And I think you've just done a great job of communicating that. Now, talk to us a little bit more on the practical side of, you know, what you have seen works well for actually getting together for meeting up. Is this a once a week thing, once a month thing? Do you start your own telegram groups? What are the practicalities like? Sure. So it's all about in person. There's a lot of people. So we have this website, right? And a lot of people kind of just saw the website as another social media network. So we try to um, dissuade people from using the tools in that regard. In reality, the website, the purpose of the website is to have people raise their hand and say, I'm interested in building freedom and, and being part of a community. And I live in this particular area. Who wants to meet up with me? These are my interests. So we're also very active on Telegram as well. Uh, most of the local groups and smaller subgroups have Telegram groups. We have a full-on Telegram directory as well. Um, maybe you could share in some of the show notes, one of those links, I'll get that to you. Uh, you can also, when you sign up on freedomcells.org, you'll find it. And so, like I said, it's all about action orientation. So find the people virtually if you need to, and then plan a meetup, ideally once a month, at least once a month. Uh, you get together, and it's not just a social, although sometimes it's good to socialize and to build that connection, right, and go have a beer, go bowling or whatever. But the idea is to get together and to, like, think about, okay, because the whole purpose is to create the institutions that are necessary in order to provide sustainable freedom for us, not like paper thing, file this to get free or 
we're going to go protest here or hope that some guy gets elected that's going to support us. We're trying to build infrastructure and systems that allow us to enjoy a high standard of living, perhaps an improved standard of living, a good quality of life, continue economic flow, continue consumption of goods and food, uh, and do so while not relying on the centralist, statist, coercive institutions. So you get together with your group and you're like, all right, where do we want to go? What's our plan for the future? What do we want to, this to develop into? You also think about what are our weaknesses? Okay, so this guy over here, he has a corporate job. And while they haven't done it yet, they've threatened to mandate vaccines or maybe it's even a possibility. So he's concerned about that. This guy over here has never grown a vegetable in his life and he gets all of his groceries from the grocery store. So we know supply chain shortages, we know mandates can put people in a difficult position. So it's like, we're, we got our people together, working together with other people makes everything more accomplishable. We become more effective. So it's like, okay, I know a friend that is an entrepreneur and he's growing his business and he's looking to hire somebody. And in fact, he's looking for someone that has similar skills to yours. Let me link you guys up. This guy's like, oh, you've never grown any food. I haven't grown any food either. But Joe over here that comes to the meetings every once in a while, he's a master gardener and he's a permaculture design specialist. So let's bring him over and let's see if he'll teach us a workshop, right? And so it all depends on where the people are in the group. But the thing I want to emphasize, Mikkel, is that it's all about action and solutions and doing things. So do you do a lot of education or do groups do a lot of education? Like, is it, all right, we're having a, Sunday morning meeting, first Sunday of every month, and someone's going to give a presentation, and then we're going to figure out how we do this? Or like, do you actually go out there and do activities like start planting a garden? Or like, what yeah. does that look like? So um, tomorrow, it might be tomorrow or Saturday, uh, people are getting together, and they're going to learn about using firearms for self-defense. That's mm -hmm. a freedom cell activity. Uh, more recently, we built three really big garden beds on my property. There was actually eight people, seven, uh, six people came out. So me and my fiance, there was actually eight people exactly. We were able to knock out those garden beds in an, in an afternoon. Um, that's something I'm so damn busy all the time. It would have taken me, you know, a week or two, little piece by piece here and there. But we all came together to make it happen. Here in Central Texas, somebody organized a food cooperative where they met with a local rancher. We pulled our money together and we purchased half a cow and then they butchered it and wrapped it up and we distributed it to one another. Uh, there's some folks, I was at Pork Fest in New Hampshire. It's this mm -hmm. annual camp out village uh, festival. And I was walking down with my kiddo. Actually, my daughter was like, hey, I wanna go buy a dart, this little dart gun thing from this person. And so I walked up with her to go buy it and we're walking by the booth and somebody runs out, Hey, you're John Bush. Oh my God, the freedom cell network. And all these people came out from their campsites and they're like, we were all, we all felt alone and isolated with all this COVID stuff. We joined the freedom cell network separately. We saw that we were in the same area and we pulled our kids out of government school and started a homeschool cooperative together. So it's nuts hearing all these stories. It's so fulfilling to know that just this just came, just started as an idea. And now there's so many people that are benefiting from it. And I want I think Derek Rose all the time because he like I had kind of pulled back. I was living in poverty. I had two kids and I was like, I gotta, I gotta start a business. I gotta focus on making money. And I pulled back from my activism. And thank God at the time, Derek was like, freedom sells, freedom sells. He was the one out there pumping it away. And he managed to get enough momentum to where it just kind of bloop, sprung up. And then people start benefiting from it. And just like a business, the best marketing is word of mouth. So you got people that are like, you're not going to believe this network. I thought I was all alone. And it's not politics because politics is divisive. It's boring. It's like your guy doesn't win. You're all defeated and stuff. This is just like we can have our eye on the prize. I did a podcast recently where I mentioned like we need to be like a horse with blinders on. And it's like Ukraine, COVID. Uh, trans women swimming, all these stupid <laughs> scandals and world events that in, at the end of the day, they don't have to make such an impact on our life. If we are in control of our own destiny, we have our own course. And so we do that on an individual level, but we most definitely maximize our capabilities when we work together with, some, with, with people that are on the same wavelength and that have the same goals. Okay. So you mentioned entrepreneurship there. So I'm guessing then that you're not charging for freedom cells. There's not an annual due or something like that, that people need to pay or opt into. How does that work? No, it's, I mean, it's just a, it's a grassroots thing. Um, That's amazing. 
Yeah, um, you know, and, and I'm Derek Bros and Ramiro. We're kind of partners in organizing and facilitating a lot of the stuff. Although we want it to be, you know, it's autonomous and independent of us, right? If somebody started like, if like if there was Nazis involved or like somebody was calling for violence, then we would try to like isolate and excommunicate them and be like, that's not the Freedom Cell brand kind of deal. Mm -hmm. But um, no, it's totally like an open source idea. Anybody can take it and do what they please with it. Um, you know, we've done fundraisers. We recently raised like $15,000 to improve the website, nice. but it's very much a grassroots volunteer nonprofit kind of deal. And I feel grateful in my life that I've found financial success through my businesses to where I can contribute to the community. And I have time now to be an activist and support the growth of this network. Same thing with Derek, same thing with Ramiro. So no, I mean, I have a business where I teach people and educate people about freedom and excellent build strategy and such. Uh, and that helps folks that are part of the Freedom Cell Network. But no, it's, it's a volunteer, autonomous kind of deal. Well, that's the nice thing, though, that someone can get involved in something like this, start it on their own or, or gather their own cadre to move forwards. And if they want more assistance, if they need more help on these things, then you do have resources that are available. But the whole thing is keeping freedom in mind and trying to encourage people to do this on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's a lot of folks that are, that are struggling financially. So we wanna make it as accessible as possible. And we're doing like, we do trainings and we do conference calls and we do workshops and, and we really wanna encourage like bottom up kind of stuff because we got skills and knowledge in certain areas, but there's a lot of folks that are in people's local areas that just have all this undiscovered wisdom that hope the local communities can tap into. So what are some other tips, tricks, strategies, things that you would encourage people to keep in mind if they're listening to this and they're saying, yes, this is an amazing idea. This is something I want to do. I want to start this in my local area. What kind of things can help them to succeed? So with my business, Live Free Academy, I have a, what I call a four-part empowerment philosophy. It's like a framework. And so this can be applied to business, uh, improving relationships with significant others or children, and it can be applied to the pursuit of freedom, and it can be applied to the success of your local freedom cell group. So it's four pieces. The first piece is mindset, all right? So you got to get your mind right. You have to believe in yourself. You have to focus on that which you want out of life rather than focusing so much energy on the negativity and the Illuminati and Klaus. Everyone's so obsessed with Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates. Like, give me a freaking break. Be obsessed with your neighbor, you know, and your, and your kids or whatever. Um, so you get your mind right. I'm a big believer in the law of attraction. You know, the more, a lot of people, like I said before, they're spending so much time behind the damn computer researching the great reset and all this terrible stuff and technocracy and war and blah, blah, blah. And like that becomes their reality because that's what they focus all their time and energy on. Meanwhile, there's others that are like getting their feet in the, in the dirt and the soil and, and they like, they just got together with 10 people and they built an entire, like there's a hempcrete workshop going on for the past five days here in central Texas. And there's like dozens of people that are building a freaking house with hemp concrete, hempcrete. And it's like, those people are free as they could ever be. Right. So it's all about like what you focus on that becomes your reality. So I'm focused on my family and friends and building this community and being out in the sun and doing cool stuff and putting these events together, bringing together hundreds of people. And I have never been more free. Meanwhile, other people are focused on uh, terror and tyranny and deception and the vaccine and vaccine passport, blah, 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 right? That's not to say we should put our head in the sand. We should be aware of that stuff, but be aware not to obsess about it, but so we can strategically avoid it. So the mindset is what's most important. That's why it's first. And then come up with a strategy. So to give advice to folks, I would say come up with an ideal vision of the life that you want to live. And then focus your energy on answering this question. How do I get from here where I'm at now to there where I want to be? And this also works with our freedom cell group. Right? What are our goals for the freedom cell group? Okay, we wanna be 50% food self-sufficient. We wanna all be able to communicate with each other even if the grid goes down. We want to be able to rally the community to support one another if we need to come and, and get each other's back if there's an emergency or some sort of somebody comes falls victim of some aggressor or whatever. And it's like, what is our goals? Okay, those are our goals. How are we going to get there? And that's where strategy comes into play. Coming up with goals, action items, objectives, coming up with a plan 
and then focusing on that plan and not letting anything take you off your groove. And sometimes you got to shift and you deviate from the plan a little bit, but you get back on the course, right? The third component is to work with a team. So when you have goals in your own life, when you have business pursuits, when you want to heal a relationship or whatever, you, you find other people that can help you in accomplishing those goals. And the final piece of the empowerment philosophy is to take massive action. So the stuff that we're aiming for is big stuff. I'm a big fan of Elon Musk. I know he's controversial in the freedom community, but I love the guy. I drive a Tesla. It is so freaking fun to drive. I love every, if I've had it for, I don't know, not that long, but a few months. But every time I get behind the wheel, it's like, this is freaking awesome. It goes zero to 60 in like three and a half seconds. Incredible. But either way, Elon Musk, I like him so much because he has these big grandiose ideas. And he's like, we're going to become, my goal is to make humans a multi-planetary species. Like that's big, big stuff. He's like, I okay. want to completely revolutionize and transform the automobile industry. And the guy's done it, you know? And so when it comes to our goals, like I want to create, I want to help to create a genuinely free society where people are able to live their lives and they're not subjected to these terrible laws that some clown in Washington, D.C. or wherever Panama government has come up for them. And that's a big picture thing, like to true sovereignty and freedom. And in order to accomplish that stuff, we need to take massive action in life. So that means less Netflix, less, uh, fewer happy hours, unless it's like a mixer with your freedom self group, I don't know. Uh, more doing, more action. Sometimes if you want change, you got to make change in your life. If you want to make big things happen, you got to give some things up. So that's where I really emphasize like massive action. We got a lot of big goals in our own lives and in our collective aims so we got to take massive action so yeah mindset strategy working with a team and massive action and you apply that in your own life your own pursuits your own business growing the podcast uh helping the kids learn to read or whatever it's all the same and when it comes to a freedom cell group you have this conscious empowered philosophy this vibe amongst the group and you can really do a lot of cool stuff yeah i like that very much absolutely and definitely starting with mindset is so, 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 so important. I get people on literally a daily basis who come to me with these false belief patterns of what they can and yeah. cannot do. And, you know, this is fine for you because you've done it before or, you know, you're privileged. And it's like, no, I mean, that's, those are a lot of excuses and uh, anyone can really do these types of things. Now, when yep. you talked about big, grandiose ideas and concepts when we're talking about Elon, do you have any big grandiose ideas for where freedom cells could go? Are you looking at, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, what you would, you know, hope to see or like to see, or at least be pointing in the direction of? Yes. So, and that's another good tip for people to like, come up with what's your, your plan for the next three months, next quarter, what's your plan for the next year, two years, five years, 10 years, right? And we know these World Economic Forum clowns and Agenda 21, they have this agenda for the 21st century, Agenda 2030, that's this big year, 2030. They went 2020 through 2030 to be a decade of transformation, as should we. So I have this vision, I call it the Confederation of Freedom Cell Communities. And it's something that we're going, that we're working towards here in Central Texas. And I wanna see other areas emulate it and basically, this is why we're, I'm doing this land summit in part, this exit and build land summit to help empower and inspire people and, and help them to buy into this vision. And so it works like this. We all move out of the cities. The cities are where most of the tyranny and technocracy come into play. It's not for everybody. You know, there's arts and economic action in cities. Cities are great, but I'm, I'd like to be within driving distance of the city, but not live within the city. I lived in the city my entire life in, in Austin. And so the idea is to move out of the city, to move out to rural country areas that are more free. Even the people there, you know, they're more conservative, kind of laid back, rugged individualist types, ranchers, farmers, at least here in Texas. Move out of the city, move into the country, buy land together, or some people buy land, other people live on the land, rent, whatever, put in sweat equity. And we start building these intentional communities. Communities where we all support one another, we raise our kids together, we have a homeschool, we have a schoolhouse on the property, we have an incredible community garden, we're off the grid, uh, we're socializing together, we're supporting one another, we are using our own network of doctors, for example. And so we're all outside the city, and then we start building these communities, 
And then just like the Freedom Cell Network, we link up the communities. Ideally, they're in the same geographic proximity, but this can expand into a global network where we trade amongst ourselves and have our own alternative currencies, for example. And then we slowly but surely start building the systems and institutions necessary in order to go about our life, right? So everybody depend, most people depend on a centralized electric grid now. We have solar panels and some Tesla power walls, which is cool. So the communities, we wanna get the communities off grid. We want to, one of the things I wanna do is create a school system. So in Austin, you have AISD, Austin Independent School District. They coercively take taxes, they fund these schools. Many of them are failing. Uh, you know, my property tax I pay, uh, the biggest chunk of it goes to the Bastrop School District. My kids are homeschooled and they're at a homeschool co-op. That's actually could use some resources, more resources. I try to support the school the best of my ability, but I'd rather those few thousand bucks go to the freaking homeschool co-op that my kids go to. So I have a vision of creating a school system where the community participants voluntarily contribute and that money gets doled out to the local co-op, the private school that's like-minded our kids go to. And, uh, you know, we, we help equip the homeschool co-op with curriculums and we have these big, you know, dances. My kids don't have a prom, they're homeschooled. So we could have this home, this freedom cell kiddo prom or whatever, you know, maybe we have our own little baseball league that we do. Uh, we have our own food production systems. Everyone's encouraged to grow, grow it on their own property, but there's a guy that has a chicken farm down the road. There's a butcher and the cattle rancher down the road. And we link up, we have our own markets. We have our own currency. We have our own barter networks. We have our own emergency response teams, right? So imagine an SUV with black and yellow light and you call the phone and they show up to support you to help put the fire out or to pull the car out of the ditch or whatever. And the idea is over time, we have essentially decoupled ourselves from the statist institutions. This is beneficial inherently, but it also presents a greater opportunity for us to come to the table. This is how I envision this playing out. We, so let's say we have 25,000 people in a given geographic area. They have all, over the next 10 years, we've all networked and we've built these structures. We then, and you know, the whole time we have a relationship with the government, I imagine, but we go and we say, look, we're no longer using almost any of your services. The only thing that we use perhaps is the roads, that's it. So we want to have a conversation about what a peaceful transition to autonomy looks like for our community, because to be honest, most of them are already pretty much autonomous anyway. And many of them have already circumvented your schemes and your controls and your regulations. So we want to, you know, we want to to, to be friendly about it. We're peaceful people. We don't want any conflict. We don't want anybody's property taken away. So what does this transition look like? And I, you know, I also envision throughout that time, we're adding value to the community. We're building shared value based on shared values. So it's not like a, a lot of people are like back in the Ron Paul days, like let's move to a county and take over the county. And it's like, there's a lot of good old boy networks in many counties and everywhere in the world that have been there for generations. So the minute you come in trying to take over or unseat their power, they get threatened and they push back. But rather, if we come into the community, we're good business people. We have booths at the farmer's market. We contribute. Like there's this, uh, in Austin, they had this huge trail of lights and it's like decked out and probably cost millions of dollars. It's overrun with all the yuppies and everything. And you got to wait in a car forever, whatever. In Bastrop, the town that I live near, there's this tiny little dinky trail of lights. And I remember just going like, oh, this is so quaint and a small town thing. I have a vision of like, I could probably already do this now, actually. But in my head, I'm like, all right, financial, more financial success. I go to the county and I'm like, I'd like to pay for a giant Christmas tree to be installed at this community thing, right? And you, you, know, you talk to the city bureaucrats and it's like, you're, you're providing value to the community. So then when you start to have the conversation of like, we're no longer going to participate in this, this, and that, but we'll still, you know, maybe we kick in for the roads because we use the roads, but we're not going to do A, B, and C. So we want to talk to you about what that looks like. And this is the vision that I have for transitioning to some semblance of autonomy. And we got to do the hard work first to build those alternative structures so we can more easily make the case that we're not draining on your system. In fact, we're adding more than we're taking out of your system and we would like to have political autonomy. What does that look like? That's amazing. And going back to your point about the schooling, I'm fully on board with this. Uh, my business partner, Michael Strong, who also lives in oh, Austin. Yeah. He's, he's speaking at the summit. 
Oh, is he really? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I'm excited to get into the summit in a minute. Yes. Michael Strong is my business partner. We run a school together called Expat International School, and wow. we're helping families from around the world because we have a lot of digital nomads, perpetual travelers, expats who are living overseas. And um, really trying to tackle a lot of the problems with education and make, you know, showcase what the alternatives are out there. Sure. What do you think the government's response will be when you go to them and say, hey, let's have a conversation about this? Do you think that you might actually get anywhere with that? Do you think that they will be receptive to this at all? So when you live out in the country, you definitely have a lot more freedom in general. And so there's two pain points that I foresee, right? The income tax and the property tax. Now there's some states and jurisdictions that don't have property tax, right? I think the income tax is gonna be easier to avoid if we have our own financial systems, our own, we trade amongst ourselves, we barter, right? Um, and maybe there's some folks that remain in the system. Like I have ambitions to be multimillionaire. I have ambitions to be a billionaire, to be honest. I think my kids may need to take up the banner, um, but that's my goal. Shoot high. Maybe I only get 10% of the goal and I have $100 million in assets or something. I don't know. But um, for most people, not everybody has those ambitions, but for most people, you can live pretty small if you have self-sufficiency and if you grow your own food and if the, you know, People are trading their clothes amongst one another, whatever. I don't know. I, I definitely don't want poverty. I want it to be posh and nice, but some people can live small and live chill, right? So my point is the income tax is going to be easier to avoid if we have our own competing systems. The property tax is going to be the big challenge. So the idea is that for the most part, people will be living in relative freedom because even a lot of building codes, they don't exist when you're out in the outside of the city limits. The big thing in, in the rural areas in Texas is the septic mafia. So the septic tank man, it's probably the septic tank installers have some sort of association. They manage to make it to where you got to have a septic tank if you have a dwelling. Somebody lives in a home, even if it's a tiny home or whatever, you got to have a septic tank, right? But in the county, it's like, don't ask, uh, ask for forgiveness, not for permission. They don't really go look on your property and stuff. Um, so there's these little small things and one of them is the property tax. So my idea is like, maybe there's some sort of compromise that can be made to where we don't use health and human services. We don't call the police anymore. We have our own emergency response. In fact, we have a couple of fire trucks then we deal with it on our own, right? Or maybe we all use hempcrete for most of the houses and they don't even catch on fire. Um, we do use the parks occasionally but we're financially abundant and we support the park program. So they got to rechange this or add a road here. And we're like, we'll pay for it. We love the park. We love this community. We want to support the community. Um, and then the roads, of course, because we're still travel to and from when we go out of town, when we go into the city. So maybe there's a compromise. It's like, we can kind of lead by, we, maybe we could innovate governance and have it be more of a pay as you go, pay for the services you use kind of deal. And one of the things I want to do with this is do this publicly and really push, push the matter and have the, the general public, the non-freedom people be like, well, yeah, why the hell should I have to pay for health and human services? We're healthy people or other homeschool families. Why should I have to pay for the public school when we, there's already homeschool voucher programs kind of like this? So, but ultimately, if we can't reach a compromise, I believe that if we have enough people that we could engage in what Gandhi called satyagraha, which is peaceful, nonviolent resistance. And it's just like, no. Like a lot of these COVID mandates, a lot of people just started ignoring them and they kind of went away in many areas. So it's just like, no, we're not gonna contribute to this anymore. We're doing our own thing. And it's like, if you come try to take our people away, we're going to get in the way of that. And if you wanna arrest three dozen people for disorderly conduct or disobeying the order of an officer, then we're going to have to deal with that through the court system or whatever. But like mm -hmm. we're prepared to, to say no peacefully, ideally. I well, don't know what it all pans out like, but, but the idea is like you get, you start building these structures and eventually you experience so much, so great a freedom that, I don't know, maybe we still participate somehow, but we're doing our own thing for the most part. Well, with the COVID man mandates, what I found a lot of times is it wasn't necessarily the police or the authorities who were pushing these types of things. It was fellow citizens. There was so much fear surrounding this that when you walk down the street, 
Karen and Chad here would push it on you and, and do this. But if you're in your own community with like-minded people, you're not going to have those same types of problems. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, again, it's really the taxation that's going to be the pain point. So it, maybe it's just a case where it's like, all right, we pay a small amount of taxes to, to, to maintain some county services. It's not the end of the world, especially if we're all abundant people and we're making bank, you know? Like my fiance is always like, we wanna, we're gonna build an intentional community on our property. We have one structure out there. Uh, and she's like, we should do yurts or we should do tiny homes or RVs because we don't have to pay property tax. And I'm like, let's just, if we gotta pay more in taxes then we just pay more in taxes. Let's just have an abundant, let's do what's best for us or what's best for the property or what's best for the aesthetics like not be in that mindset. I used to have a poverty mindset as an activist. And I'd say, I don't want to make, I want to make as little money as possible because I want to fund the man as little as possible. But then like the electricity was getting shut off and my kids, they never starved or anything, but like we had very few choices in the pantry. It was always the same thing. Let's make some spaghetti again or mac and cheese. And so um, it's all about mindset really at the end of the day. Yeah, I help people with moving offshore. So we deal with a lot of the tax issues, but we're not doing it because of a scarcity mindset whatsoever. We're doing it because, you know, I do encourage people to make absolutely as much money as possible. And I also encourage them to keep as much money as possible. Oh, yeah. You know, I think that that is just so, so, so important. All right, let's dig into the conference. Explain to us a little bit about the conference, what you guys are going to be doing, what's going to, who else is going to be featured. I'm excited now to hear that Michael is going to be there. Yeah, Michael Strong is amazing. And he's yeah. like, he's like a Renaissance man himself. He does the education and all the free private city kind of stuff too. He's, yep. he's an incredible dude. Okay, so we're doing this summit. It's the second time that we've done it. It's called the Exit and Build Land Summit. The long name is the Exit and Build Land Acquisition and Community Development Summit. But that's my, a mouthful. My co organizers thought it was too long. So we just called it the Exit and Build Land Summit. The idea is to equip people with the tools and knowledge necessary for them to transition from a city life to a life in the country where they are self sufficient, where they grow their own food, where they are connected with the community. We have a heavy emphasis on intentional community, which in the strongest sense is living on the same property and living in a communal sense, not like a commune. People can have private property or maybe there's a communal area or maybe it's all private property or maybe it's all communal. If people wanna do that, that's their thing. But it's also, if you don't wanna live in community like that, we wanna equip people with tools and skills that will help them to build community with their neighbors, the guy down the street, the potluck, the workshop, whatever, getting the kids together. And so that's really what it's all about. It's a three-day conference. People can sign up and watch completely for free, day one and day two. You don't have to pay anything, right? You just got to register and you're in. And, or if people want to take it deeper, they'll be able to watch online via Zoom. They can ask questions. They can participate in day three. On day three, we'll hear from Joel Salatin. We're going to be doing immersive, intensive workshops with different tracks. It'll be more customized. We're going to have teachers. There's going to be teachers that lead the workshops. Then we're going to have facilitation teams. I call them empowerment teams that help make sure people are getting everything they need out of the event so they can implement it when they get home. Uh, we're also going to do intentional community speed dating. So people that are looking to build a community or they want to build a community around homeschooling or around cryptocurrency or they want to do something in Texas or Panama, for example, uh, will probably be Central America or South America. We'll break it off into regions. We'll break it off into topics. That's also taking place on Sunday. Uh, so people can attend free. They can attend with a virtual immersion pass to access that stuff, or they can join us in person. We're gonna have over 500 people here in Central Texas at the Bastrop Convention Center. It's gonna be really special. Everybody uh, has local or farm to table meals included with their ticket. There's gonna be childcare provided as well. It's gonna be a wonderful networking opportunity. And we've really brought together, and I'm, I'm just blown away by the magnitude of speakers that we've managed to get. We got Joel Salatin. He'll be speaking on the Sunday thing only. Paul Wheaton, he's an incredible permaculture teacher. He also does intentional community. Uh, we found, uh, we, we managed to book Diana Leap Christian. She's one of the world's leading experts on intentional community. She wrote this awesome book, Creating a Life Together, Practical Tools to Grow Eco-Villages and Intentional Communities. Jack Spierko is a good friend of mine, the Survival Podcast. Marjorie Wildcraft, she does the Grow Network. She's incredible as well. 
Uh, Joel Skousen of Strategic Relocation, which some of your audience is probably familiar with his work. Uh, Magat Wade, that's Michael's uh, wife. She mm -hmm. does awesome work when it comes to entrepreneurship. And she's going to talk about, because people have these limiting beliefs. And they're like, I want to buy land. I want to get out of the city, but I don't have any money. I can't possibly do it. Down payment, blah, blah, blah. So we're encouraging her to share about how entrepreneurship can be a vehicle towards achieving these goals. Uh, Cynthia Tino with the Foundation for Intentional Community. Mark Frazier, he's with the Startup Society's Foundation. Stephen Brooks, he does this intentional community in, in uh, Costa Rica called Punta Mona. They actually have like a retirement community that's attached to it as well. Uh, Derek Bros, good friend. And just Michael Strong is going to teach about alternative education. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's super, super duper groovy. It, it's hosted by Live Free Academy, my business, and the Central Texas Freedom Cell Network. A lot of folks are volunteering and, and supporting and, and helping to execute one heck of an event. So we did it once before in November. It was a huge success. We had 25,000 people register, 19,000 views during the live stream, hundreds of people, uh, almost 1,000 people bought the immersion pass. So we're super excited for people to, to get involved. And it's, it's one of those things where people, they feel like something's not right with their life. And oftentimes they're just carrying out a program that was imparted upon them by their parents, by the school system, by this whole industrialized society thing. Like I'm a fan of business and capitalism and stuff, but I'm not a fan of the nine to five and pay a good chunk of your money to the government and rat race, wait in traffic, blah, blah, blah. And I think this type of lifestyle we're talking about, getting back to nature, uh, working and living alongside like-minded people that aren't Karens, that aren't going to blast you for not wearing a mask, that are actually going to be curious why you're wearing a mask if you do happen to wear one. Um, <laughs> You know, get the kids together and raising a new generation in this vein. I think it's really going to increase people's quality of life and most definitely increase the level of freedom they enjoy in their lives. Well, I love it because this is the exact type of thing that I'm so into. And I've been using the offshore and expat space as my vehicle for more freedom. But it's so amazing to be able to learn about all the different things that you are doing. And I can't wait to attend the conference as well. I'm going to have to do a virtual ticket. I'm not going to be able to fly in for it, but I'm super excited for the virtual ticket. If my listeners want to find out more about the conference, if they want to find out more about you, John, where can we send them? Yeah. And, and you know, there's a lot of overlap with the expat community because we have so many people in the free cell network or just that we learn about or come into contact with in our activism that want to escape a political jurisdiction that is just getting a little too authoritarian because a lot of these governments really showed their true colors. A lot of folks in Canada, especially folks are moving to Mexico. A lot of people are flocking here to central Texas all over the world. So it presents an opportunity for people to go to a place. And it's like, once we go to a place, what type of lifestyle do we want to live? And so we're hoping to encourage this, you know, back to basics homesteading, but with a twist with the cryptocurrency connected through the internet as well. But yeah, so you've got a special link set up. We're super excited for your audience to participate and attend. We added all sorts of bonuses. Like I did this workshop, Exit and Build Life Design. So we talked about all these different holistic areas that you could do with your Freedom Cell Network. I did a two-day workshop. It's over 12 hours of content uh, that breaks down how you can implement this stuff in your personal life, come up with a plan, come up with a strategy and execute upon it. And then we also have a bonus that includes the replay of all the videos from the last summit. So we're going to include that for folks that register uh, uh, through your show, right? So people can click the links and they will be able to either sign up for free, no problem, day one and day two. Or like I said, we'd love for you to join us with the virtual immersion pass so you can participate in day three, more interaction, Joel Skousen, intentional community speed dating. Maybe you'll find some people that can move somewhere and y'all could start the community. And for the folks that are interested in showing it up in person, we strongly encourage you to purchase a ticket as soon as possible because they're selling really fast and that's going to be a really magical experience. So I think it's a great fit for your audience and we'd love to see as many people as possible participate. Brilliant. I love it, John. And everybody, I will make sure that all of the links are in the show notes at expatmoneyshow.com under John Bush's episode. And I'll also be putting it out on the newsletter this week so you guys can follow those links and get involved. John, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge. Great conversation. And I will talk to you soon. Hey, thanks for having me.